I saw a practitioner who didn't know what they were doing for two years and I just got sicker. I did struggle with some mental anxiety and brain fog while I was on my other diet, but that was mainly due to my due to chronic inflammatory response syndrome. I also have brain atrophy that has improved with the carnivore diet. I previously had a lot of meltdowns and those meltdowns have gotten less and less with this way of eating, especially when I'm deeper in ketosis. I also want to encourage others who aren't feeling that the carnivore diet is taking them to 100% to seek out potential second dairy things that are causing their issues. Because the carnivore diet has helped me a lot, but it's never going to take me to 100%. There we go. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to uh, welcome our guest, Helen, today. Helen, how are you doing today? I'm good, sir. How are you? I'm also doing well. Where, where are you, if you don't mind, where are you located? Where I'm in the Woodlands, Texas, but I'm originally from Germany. Oh, okay. Interesting. I was born in Germany originally. I only lived there for about a year. <laughs> and I'm going to be right next to the Woodlands next week. My my sister and my mother live in a place called Spring, Texas, which I'm sure you're familiar with. That's actually my zip code. <laughs> okay. I'll be, maybe you can cool it off for me before I get there. I look, it looks like it's going to be about 100 degrees while I'm there. So hot, hot and humid. I know Houston's always fun in the summer for sure. So anyway, with that out of the way, a welcome. I guess we'll just get started into, give us a little bit about your background. You, know, you grew up in Germany. How did you get here? What was, I guess you went through some sort of health struggle, I'm guessing. Maybe you can start with that and tell us where you started. Yes, sir. So when I was six years old, my family relocated to Houston or because of my dad's job. And I've been going back to Germany almost every year in the summer. But after I got really sick, I've unfortunately not been able to travel back anymore. It's just too risky right now. But yeah, so I was fairly healthy until I was 16. I would say I always had a pretty clean diet. Of course, I didn't eat no junk food, but <laughs> I've always cooked from scratch. And it seemed like I was very healthy. And then I got hit with mononucleosis and my body just wasn't able to recover from it. I spent my entire junior year of high school at home and I never read the rebound. And I think at, that's the point where I can see now that my body was just a toxic bucket had just overflown and my body was no longer able to heal and help itself. And I was just um, a few years ago diagnosed with chronic inflammatory response syndrome, which is that genetic um, predisposition that where the body is not able to build an antibody to clear biotoxins. And that includes molds, certain bacteria, and also tick-borne um, infections. And I recently, or a few years ago, found out that I had this and that I was exposed to mold chronically. And I would say that, yeah, that was my breaking point, the mold. And also I have a tick-borne illness called Babesia, which is basically a parasitic infection of the red blood cells. But before we knew all of that, I was diagnosed with hypoplastic bone marrow, which is where the red blood or the bone marrow transforms from stem cells that produce blood to fat, which um, I also later found out was due to toxicity. So I basically, I'm, a, I'm unfortunately very toxic and that created a bunch of downstream effects like severe weight loss and also my, I was very anemic. I had a hemoglobin of four <laughs> at one point. And now luckily with the carnivore diet, I was able to restore that. And now I'm sitting at 14, <laughs> which is a very nice change, but yeah, it's been a long journey. Yeah. Hemoglobin of four for reference, <laughs> anything we would often transfuse people if they got below six and you know, anything below eight is considered abnormal. And, and usually it's somewhere around 10 to 10 to 15 somewhere in that neighborhood is typically 10 to 16 something like that's pretty normal and i think a lot of times there's some called anemia of chronic disease and so if you have a chronic persistent infection sometimes that can lead to anemia there's there's other causes obviously but um so you said you had a clean diet growing up how would you describe it besides clean can mean a lot of things so a lot of oh, what was, yes what, sorry what was, it? what was it no processed food no sugary stuff what, what kind of stuff are you eating I would say my mom was always very mindful of sugar intake, but of course I did have dessert every now and then. And we cooked a lot from scratch. So we always had meat, dairy, eggs. We were not vegan by any means, vegetables. And I would say mainly had potatoes as our source of starch. 
and then fruit. But of course, we also would occasionally have some bread and other things like that. So I would say I went gluten free my early teens, but before then, I did eat gluten as well. Why did you go gluten free? Was there gut issues that you're having? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. when I was infected with mononucleosis, my gut basically stopped working. I also rapidly lost a lot of weight. I was around 130 pounds. I'm five tens. And then I dropped down to 65 at one point just because my gut wasn't absorbing anything anymore. And with the help of the carnivore diet, I was able to restore all my weight. So I'm very grateful for that. But yes, it was originally due to just gut issues. So I guess, so just to sum, so you had a couple of infectious type of thing, mononucleosis, babesius, and just sequela from that. So that, that those combinations of things just made you sick. You lost a lot of weight. You became very anemic. When, when, where were you at your lowest point? What year? How old were you? So when I was 16 is when I had mononucleosis, although I'm 21 right now. And I would say that was not my lowest point. My lowest point was two years ago when I was 19 and I was down to 65 pounds. My hemoglobin was four. And Although I was diagnosed with a lot of things before then, including the bone marrow failure and the chronic inflammatory response syndrome, there wasn't really anything that they could have they told me to do. The hematologist just told me, come when you need blood, which really isn't very helpful um, to heal. And eventually I just found ways to help myself, including diet and lifestyle. But I do want to say that for the infections, things like the babesiosis and the chronic inflammatory response syndrome, I do need medication because my body just does not know how to build an antibody and no amount of food or meat will ever teach it to do that. So that's where I'm following the shoemaker protocol to help my body heal. Okay. I'll, we'll get into that in a second. I'm not familiar with the shoemaker protocol, but so you're down to 65 pounds. That's tiny. You're like 10 years old size or something like that. And that's pretty small, nine years old or something like that. How tall are you, by the way? I'm 5'10". So five it's severely ten. underweight. Wow. That really is. And you had to been people, were, you, were your parents a little concerned? I, I can't imagine it wouldn't be shockingly concerned uh, at that weight. Yeah, we were all very frightened and scared, but no one knew what to do. It was just, I was just, I was eating. We weren't concerned that I had an eating disorder, but I was just not absorbing anything. And I went to doctors who just accused me of having an eating disorder because no one could fathom why I was dropping all the weight and all my GI tests were normal, except for pancreatic enzymes. But that to the doctors wasn't really enough to explain this drastic weight loss. And looking back at it, I think my body was just so fed up, so toxic that it just wasn't working and absorbing like it should have. When, when, you, when you were 65 pounds, what were you eating on a daily basis? What were you trying to eat to, to restore your weight or just to survive, I guess? I was having severe digestive issues, so I couldn't really eat a variety of things. I was basically down to eating lean meat and vegetables, but I would eat bowls and bowls, but it was just wasn't enough. Were you vomiting some of it up? Was it just passing through you? It was just passing okay. through and I would just eat the entire day. <laughs> it just kept passing. Okay. And the vegetable, obviously most of it was vegetable. I would imagine you don't typically see meat and generally doesn't pass through our colon very much at all. Okay. That's got to be obviously. So they give you blood transfusions. Did they try to put you on medications or anything like antibiotics for the infections or anything like that? Well, the, I didn't, I wasn't diagnosed with Babesia until a few months ago. So I'm just now starting to treat that with antimalarials. At that point, we didn't know I was infected with that yet. And I also don't know if I had already had it then, but it was just recently detected. But I was put on antibiotics because I had an infection on my foot. It was IV antibiotics and around that time. And actually, we think that's the reason that my bone, my blood continued to fall because I have a genetic condition as well called hereditary serocytosis, where my blood cells are produced in the wrong shape. Mine are spheres, not the little flat, little regular blood cells. And they, sometimes when you take certain medications, they, they fall apart. And we think that the certain antibiotics that were 
given to me IV were the reason that my hemoglobin fell low. I see. Okay, so, that makes sense. That makes sense because it's almost analogous. It's like a sickle cell anemia in a way. When you have abnormally shaped red blood cells, are more fragile and they break more, and so you don't have as many intact ones circulating around. If they're not intact, they're not transporting oxygen as they're supposed to. So you're in this state of 65 pounds. Obviously, I imagine what was your mental state? I would imagine sad or somewhat. I don't know. Were you confused or angry or what was going on mentally? I think looking back, I was severely dissociated with the condition. I remember when I went into the emergency room to get my blood transfusion, I they tried to put me in a wheelchair and I was like slapping up and was like, no, I can walk. I don't think I realized how sick I was. And I think that's also a way of your body protecting itself. You don't really ever want to see yourself as weak. But now that I'm stronger, I look back and I want to cry at the photos. But in that moment, I didn't feel that way at all. I think that calmness and that trust that I was going to be okay is what kept me alive. But now I'm doing a lot of like trauma release therapy because it's traumatic to basically starve. So now every time I eat, sometimes I get anxious because I'm scared I'm not like getting enough food. So I'm working on that with my therapist. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm glad you're recovering because that, that sounds like it's an awful situation being for anybody, particularly a younger person. So what the doctors basically said, we can't figure it out. Here's some blood transfusions and maybe told you to eat more. Was that effectively what was told? No, they didn't even comment on my diet other than the fact that they thought it was weird. I wasn't really eating gluten. They were like, there's no reason for you to be gluten-free. The gastroenterologist basically told me to eat more bread. So they never commented on the amount I was eating. They basically just said, we don't know why you have messed up bone marrow. Just come back when you need blood. And then they also said that if it gets too bad, I need a bone marrow transplant. And then there was also some talk of potential toxicity. I do have pretty bad lead poisoning um, from my mom that she passed on to me and also grew up in a German village with open cast mining. So I was exposed to a lot of heavy metals. So there is some theory that it's it died due to toxicity since I wasn't really malnourished yet when I was diagnosed with bone marrow failure. Because you developed this sort of situation here in the U.S. You weren't still living in Germany, right? Correct. You said to go back to visit maybe for a little bit each year or something like that. Yeah, but I feel like it might take some time for the body to develop the hypoplastic bone marrow because I was diagnosed when I was 18 years old, but I had my entire childhood to have developed the toxicity. And I might, I don't know if the mononucleosis infection was the breaking point where my body just couldn't keep up with the bone marrow anymore. So we don't really know when it atrophied, but we just, we knew that in 2018, it was atrophied. All right, so you've got hereditary spherocytosis, you've got babesiosis, you had a mononucleosis infection, you've got anemia, probably secondary to the spherocytosis, you've got profound weight loss, digestive issues. What were your what was your function level of function like at that extreme low weight? Were you just not doing much? I can't imagine you're running around and doing backflips. You can't see very facetious here, but what were you able to do at that level? What was your quality of life like? Here's the crazy part. I don't know how I did it. But I still managed to go on daily walks. I still cooked all my food. I was weak, but I was still functional. That's why I don't think we were ever really super concerned because I wasn't just laying on the couch. It's almost like my body got used to having such a low level of blood and oxygenation because it happened relatively slowly. Every month, my hemoglobin would drop by one point. And then at four, it was like, okay, now we need blood or she's going to die kind of thing. But I was still walking. I remember the morning of my transfusion before the doctor called and was like, you need to come. I went on a really big walk and we were getting ready to go to an appointment. And on the way to the appointment, they were basically calling me to the ER. My mom was like, oh no, she's fine. And (laughs) that again shows like the amount of dissociation that we had from the situation and probably again, a way for us to protect ourselves. Okay. Interesting. So how did you, I assume you you said you use a carnivore diet to restore your weight. How did you decide to do that? Where did that come from? That's not, that's still, it's not the typical sort of response. How did you (laughs) decide to do that? Did did you try adjusting your diet prior to this at any time? And then what drove you to carnivore? Yes. So here's 
a crazy story. So before my blood transfusion, I was not really able to digest fat very well. Every time I had it, I would bloat. And then we saw a gastroenterologist who suggested doing a fecal fat test. So they you collect your stool and they assess how much fat is passing through. But that had to be provoked with 100 grams of fat every day. And at the same time of my blood transfusion, I also had exosome treatment, which is similar to stem cells, but they don't have a DNA. They take on the host or my DNA. There was rumors that these things can help some tissue restore itself. And we did it because I was in such a weakened state that we thought anything could help. And so I did this provoked fat test and lo and behold, I was able to digest the fat. And we think that the exosome treatment revived my pancreas's ability to do that. And I just started to, after those five days of the test, I just continued to eat fattier meat and eat avocados again. And then I would just, I slowly increased my intake of fat. And then a year later, I decided that I plateaued at 93 pounds and I just wasn't gaining anymore. And I saw some Instagram accounts of people that were able to recover using the carnivore diet. And I just thought, okay, I'm going to try it. And I've been carnivore for almost 10 months now. And that's the way I was able to go from 93 to 123 pounds. Okay. So you got to 93 before, and then you put on another 30 pounds of, I assume, lean tissue, I would imagine. I, I imagine you gain a little bit of body fat, but mostly lean tissue. How did the, so you went, you said you had the exosome treatment and you were able to better digest fat. Uh, you saw some social media stuff and said, hey, let me try this carnivore diet. When did you start to feel different once you started doing a fully carnivorous diet? How long did it take you to start noticing, hey, this is working for me? I would say the weight gain took a few months. I was steady until February and then all of a sudden it just went (laughs) and my pants started to get tight, which I was happy about. And my, the biggest, the two things that I'm really happy about with the carnivore diet is my weight gain, but also my CBC started to transform completely. I was sitting at an hemoglobin of about 10 in November and The past one was a 14.9, which is a pretty big jump for someone who's so anemic. And my CBC looks healthier than some people who have no blood conditions, which I'm really proud of. But a red blood cell takes about three months to mature. And I would say it took about three months for my CBC to improve as well. And my energy level was never really bad. I did struggle with some mental anxiety and brain fog while I was on my other diet, but that was mainly due to my due to chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Unfortunately, secondary to that, I also have brain atrophy. That's quite common with biotoxin illness and it is reversible, but it does cause some brain fog and anxiety for me. And I would say that has improved with the carnivore diet. I previously had a lot of meltdowns and those meltdowns have gotten less and less with this way of eating, especially when I'm deeper in ketosis. You mentioned brain atrophy. So that means actual shrinkage of the brain. Mm-hmm. How would you verify that? I mean, do you have an MRI scan or something like that? Yes, I had a neuroquant MRI scan done. That is pretty typical for diagnosing chronic inflammatory response syndrome. And I would say my, you can see that very a lot of parts of my brain have atrophy down to the first or second percentile. And some are in the 80th, 90th, which shows that my brain used to be bigger. Uh, Have you had a subsequent uh, MRI to see if that is, in fact, because you said it's reversible. Have you had a subsequent MRI to verify that or? Uh, No, I just recently had the first one uh, in March. So it's going to take a bit longer. And I am on a medication. It's called VIP spray. It stands for vasointestinal peptide, which is produced naturally in your body, but with SERS patients the um, brain stops producing it if they're very sick and replacing getting replacement peptide will help um, not only regrow my brain, but also restore mitochondrial gene expression because that is also altered by biotoxins. Interesting. And the VIP that you've been on, I just use an intranasal spray, I believe, but when was that introduced? And do you think that had an impact on weight gain, CBC recovery of your hemoglobin? 
I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know enough about the drug to, to say if that has an impact on that. But how do you know this wasn't due to those medications and, and not versus a, a carnivore diet? That's a very interesting point. So the VIP, I didn't start until I would say six weeks ago. So I had already gained a lot of my weight back then. However, I did start proper SERS treatment in February with a shoemaker certified doctor. And that involves taking a binder called cholestyramine to help bind out the biotoxins and help my body calm down. And you're right, my weight gain did start around February. So it's possible that both the combination of the carnivore diet and the removal of the biotoxins together has helped me put on weight again. So you're right, I won't ever know what it was, but I'm just grateful that I put on some weight. Yeah, no doubt. It's particularly 5'10", 65 or 93 or whatever you were. That's obviously, it's not sustainable <laughs> for, for, for anyone. So I guess because I'm not familiar with it, maybe you describe this shoemaker protocol. Is this, I don't know who, shoe, is shoemaker a physician or something like that? It came up with this and maybe you can describe what that means. Yes, sir. So are you familiar with what SERS is or should I give a brief explanation of that as I'm well? familiar with it, but I don't know the audience is. So you might want to, you can maybe touch on that for the people that aren't familiar with that. There's some people that have recently made aware of that. Judy Cho has been talking about it quite a bit within the carnivore uh, community. But you can, yeah, sure. And go ahead and describe that if you don't mind. Okay. I'll give a really short summary. So basically it's a genetic predisposition and certain individuals are not able to make an antibody when they're exposed to biotoxins, it's a failure of the innate immune system to present the biotoxin to the adaptive, which will make a antibody. And in turn, first we have the biotoxin that's circulating and causing issues. And then we also have the innate immune system, which still continues to see the antibody, but it's not able, sorry, see the biotoxin, but it's not able to make an antibody. So it starts producing cytokines. So now we have the cytokines and the biotoxins roaming around and they start destroying tissues. They start dysregulating hormones. So the person affected loses regulation of basically their immune system. And that causes a ton of downstream effects if the biotoxin isn't removed. And that is where the Shoemaker protocol comes in. Dr. Shoemaker is a physician who discovered SIRS and has created a protocol that will help the people affected by it completely heal. And it requires that the patient gets out of exposure. So in my case, that meant that I we had to remediate our house. And right now, since I'm in treatment, I'm not really able to go anywhere because I'm not sure if buildings are moldy. And in Texas, a lot of buildings are moldy due to the humidity and just how poorly buildings are built. So. While I'm in treatment, I'm housebound, but it's not forever. And I also have to take a binder that will help my body bind up the biotoxins and remove them so my immune system can calm down and no longer produce the cytokines. And then once your body is basically, uh, once the biotoxins have been removed, then you can start fixing hormone problems that have developed or other conditions that are secondary to the immune system going wild. Yeah, there's quite a bit going on. So when you say biotoxins, in your case, you're describing mold and there's a lot of things that are biological that are also toxic to the body. So what are these typical biotoxins that you're uh, describing? So the condition is most commonly triggered by being exposed to a water damaged building. And Dr. Shoemaker did this research and found that the environment of a water damaged building is very different than outdoor biotoxins. Inside the buildings, there is not really any competition between the molds. So certain ones can dominate and produce mycotoxins, which are not being able, my body can't remove. And then there's also bacteria that colonize these buildings like actinomycetes, and then a bunch of other things like beta-glucans, fructans, I don't even know what they are. That's one, <laughs> that is one issue, endotoxins as well. And then some people are also susceptible to biotoxins produced by things that ticks transmit, so Lyme disease. And then there's a whole other host of people that are predisposed to getting sick from being exposed to algae blooms, fisteria bacteria, 
and then ciguatera, which is transmitted by reef fish. So it's a whole slew of things. And Riku spiders. I think that's it. <laughs> okay. And, and so you say you try to avoid exposure. That's why you're recovering from that. Obviously, you can't go your rest of your life not being exposed to things unless you're a complete. I guess you could live in the desert and shut yourself in. Yeah. So it's not practical. How long does this shoemaker protocol last? What does it involve? You mentioned the binders, the cholestyramine, which is uh, it's been around for quite a while. When will your treatment be done? You anticipate with this? I think it really depends on the person. I unfortunately was hit very hard. I, there are a lot of different haplotypes, which is your genetic predisposition to getting SIRS. And I have one of the, I guess, worst ones. It's called the Dreda gene. And those people tend to have a longer recovery. It's really hard to say because it just depends on how well your body responds to the treatment. I think most people are through within two years. And within the first few months, they're already able to do more things. And basically what needs to happen, we have a hormone called MSH or melanocyte stimulating hormone. And that is the regulator of your immune system in some ways. And that begins to drop. So your body loses regulation when you're exposed, when you're sick. And as you heal, your MSH will return back to normal range, which will give you some more immune system regulation. And when that is up, you're able to get exposed without it being a massive problem if you make sure to take your binder. But one as long, so basically I would say you're better when your MSH comes up and that varies based on person. Mine is still very low. But you mentioned you were eating lean meats and vegetables as the only thing you were able to eat and not tolerating a lot of it just being passed through you. Now, what does your diet look like today? What is it? What is a typical day or week where the diet look like for you? So I eat three meals a day right now. That's what works best for me with my medication schedule. And I would say in the morning, I always eat the same thing because I'm a creature of habit. I always eat a hot dog sausage. I know they're my favorite. And right now I'm eating, I make waffles out of Equip Foods chocolate protein powder and eggs. And I top those with raw butter. So that's my breakfast. And then for lunch, I usually make about 14 ounces of meat or fish with usually some sort of steak or salmon. And I'll add an egg or two and also some fat. It varies on the day. My lunch is what I always change. And then for dinner, I'll have a pound or so of some roast. I really like roast with egg yolk, bone marrow, and raw butter. Okay. And your digestive ability to tolerate that better, I assume? Yes. Unfortunately, I still have some looser stools, but that is due to my SIRS. And I don't think it has anything to do with diet. So it doesn't matter what I eat. My stools are always very loose. Have you tried moderating the fat content with that and tried up, tried down and still the same? Yes. Response? I just have a very fast transit time. So interesting. And then were you in school at some point? Did you go to pick up, take up some classes? Mm -hmm. what, what kind of stuff are you studying? So I was at Rice University for my freshman year, but I was unfortunately, I had to stop because that was when we thought my bone marrow was looking really bad and I just started to get really sick. And I haven't been back at college since, but I do take some courses on the side. I have a degree in functional blood chemistry and functional nutrition that I did online. And I'm also working on becoming certified as a shoemaker certified coach to help others who also have SIRS. Interesting. Yeah. I'm in high school because I grew up in, in not far from where you are down in on the coast there in Lake Jackson, Texas. And I had a, a scholarship thing to rice, but I ended up not going there. But anyway, it's a good school. But anyway, there's a, so what has been the, your parents' response to you eating basically an all meat diet? Have they been concerned about that? No, my mom actually eats pretty carnivore too. And my dad told me he never liked vegetables. So he's happy. <laughs> and I yeah, did have some trouble that I think there is that conflicting advice that fat is bad, fat makes you fat. So sometimes I would say my dad is a bit concerned that he's going to get too fat eating this way, but my mom loves it as well. And we're all okay with it. I think sometimes my parents 
do wish that we could eat more normal, quote unquote, but they're not really opposed to it since they're seeing that it's helping me. But yeah, clearly it is. How And how long did it take you to go from 93 pounds to, you said 100 and I think 30-ish or so, how long did it take? I would say in February is when I started really gaining weight. And now it's July, I would say. I gained 15, 20 pounds within two months, but it took some time. My body had to, maybe I feel like the first few months, my body was just restoring its lost nutrients. And then it was able to finally utilize everything and put on more mass because I didn't really increase my food intake. I just started to gain. Okay. And then what about, you said you were maybe brain fog, weren't able to think clearly. How, how is that affecting? Obviously you're having a conversation. You seem to be doing quite well now, but how has that been for you? I would say I still struggle after a, being focusing for maybe an hour or so, but sorry, up to then it's not a big problem, but I have to say that if ever I do get exposed to water damage building, which happens sometimes, I have to get blood work done. I have to sometimes hop into the store. I feel it right away and my brain is back to being pudding. I would say the diet is really helping, but I do need the protocol to heal. And I think I also want to encourage others who aren't feeling that the carnivore diet is taking them to 100% to seek out potential secondary things that are causing their issues because the carnivore diet has helped me a lot, but it's never going to take me to 100%. Yeah. It's a fair statement. Obviously there are other things outside of diet that, that can impact you, chronic infections, things like that. So you have to have a kind of a holistic approach. Do you, I guess you don't know, because I'm just wondering the carnivore diet has been symbiotic with the shoemaker protocol has it facilitated do you think you might do worse if you're still on a mixed diet and doing this protocol it's all speculative but does shoemaker just does he describe diet in his protocol at all is there any consideration of that dr shoemaker does not really make a big mention of anything he does suggest going low amulose amulose is a certain carbohydrate found in starches i think and he says that the spikes insulin spikes created by amulose are inflammatory. So he does say these clear of sugar, but he doesn't ever really say to go carnivore. But I did see many people who have SIRS go carnivore. That's why I went so drastic and went carnivore. And my doctor, I go see Dr. Peg DiTulio at Regenix Healing. She is pro carnivore diet while healing from SIRS. And I would say that I think I am dysfunctional because I really watch my diet. I think diet is key, but it's just not the cure. And this, you mentioned a doctor, is she in Houston as well? It's pro carnivore. No, I think she's in Massachusetts. She sees me virtually. I see. Okay. I would imagine this stuff has to be expensive, all these different treatments and stuff like that. Is that fair to say or no? Yes, it's very expensive. <laughs> Your parents helping you with that? I'm, I'm guessing maybe. I don't yes. Know. I'm very lucky that my parents are helping me. And it's just also just a big hassle because you have to do this, you have to do that. I just had a blood test done to assess my mitochondrial gene expression, and that had to be sent on dry ice overnight to Boston. It's just a lot of work. It's really, I would say that's without my parents, I couldn't do it because I'm just not strong enough to take my blood test to a UPS and then argue with them how fast I can get it to Boston overnight. Like, it's just, I don't think it's fair towards people that are the sick, but I'm really grateful for all the support that I'm getting. Yeah, that's great. What, as far as, oh, are you, do you share any of this stuff online? Is there like a social media aspect to, to, to this recovery that you do? Yes, I have an Instagram account called cure.eated. And I have recently started to share about SIRS and how it's helped, how the carnivore diet has helped me. And I do post some recipes as well. But that's fairly new. Okay. Now you mentioned there were you were you had pictures of yourself when you were very thin. Do you ever share those, or is that something you're comfortable sharing? I am now. I posted a few weeks ago with those photos because I think it's time for people to see how sick people are getting and how you can help yourself. I'm still really mad is the wrong word, but just disappointed that my hematologist just told me like come when you need blood like that really isn't a solution there are 
very impactful things like my diet, like it increased my hemoglobin that much. Do I know if my bone marrow is recovered? No, but I'm more functional in my daily life. And I want others to learn that too. Yeah. In the defense of the hematology, got a hemoglobin of four, they would be probably competing malpractice not to recommend a, a transfusion at that point. Oh, no, I'm not saying I needed the blood. I'm very grateful about the blood. There are two people out there that saved my life and I'm very thankful, but just they could have, I w- would have wished that they would have also given me practical tips for my daily life. Yeah, sure. And, and, and they're just not trained to in many cases. I don't know. You know, expecting to get perhaps financial advice from a plumber that they may know, but most of them <laughs> know what they're trained for. They're just not. It's, as a physician, I can tell you, we're not trained for really much on that stuff. Some people have better insight than others. So as you've been recovering and you obviously you've done, you've been through a lot and you've obviously been reading a lot about this stuff. What has been the, have you had any surprises? Let me guess this. Since transitioning to a ta- carnivore diet, have you had any negatives? Has there been any negative effects? Because I always, we hear all about the positive, but I always try to ask about the negatives. Is there many negatives that you've noticed thus far? I don't think any of the negative effects I'm experiencing are from the carnivore diet. I'm just not healthy altogether. So I could say my digestion is bad because of carnivore, but that would be very superficial of me. I know my digestion is bad because I have underlying issues like MSH deficiency, but my digestion really hasn't improved on carnivore. That would be my biggest problem, I would say. As far as what are your plans once you recover? And I'm, I'm hopeful and you know optimistic that you will go back to school. What are you going back to rice? What are you going to do? I think I'll see when I get there, but I definitely think I'm going to go into the health and wellness space and help others navigate chronic illness as well. Because when I was so sick, I didn't really have anyone that could hold my hand or give me advice. I had to fend for myself and I wish I could just help others in similar situation. Just know what I didn't know then. So I'm looking forward to becoming Shoemaker Protocol certified. And I also think I will probably eventually have my own health coaching business. Yeah, fair enough. And I think that's, I think it's interesting because a lot of us that have medical illnesses, we have this sort of the reflux sort of answers, I'm going to go to the doctor and he's going to give me pills and I'm going to get better. But in a lot of cases, like you said, sometimes it's stuff that's outside of allopathic medicine that that seems to work. And it's been, in many cases, it's been denigrated, it's been ridiculed, it's been called quackery. But at the same time, there's a lot of people that the, the, the sort of the Western medical system has let down significantly. And I would conclude you in one of those, you had a lot of tests done. You had every test known to man. Some of them I've not even heard of, but it's interesting to see that. Do you find that you said you had, even when you're at the, at the smallest, you still were eating a lot, a lot. Has this changed your appetite in any way? Do you feel more satiated? Do you feel more hungry? Do you feel, or just, do you feel like it's normalized? What is your perception on appetite? It's funny because I think due to having that traumatic experience of starving, I would say my appetite is very big all the time. And I do have to stop myself after one and a half pounds of meat where I'm like, okay, I had enough food. I need to understand why my brain is still scared. And I would say my appetite isn't very regulated right now, but I have to work on the mental aspect of it because most people I think struggle with being overweight and they won't ever really understand what it's like to have to desperately gain weight or you die. So whenever I see food, my brain just wants it all. And after I eat dinner, for example, sometimes I know I've had over... 1,500 calories and it's, this is enough for one meal. And if I'm still feeling hungry, I have to ask myself, what am I scared of? And then I'll journal. Okay. All right. Clearly, if that's what you need to put on weight, then you need to eat. Are you at your goal weight right now? Are you still trying to gain weight or where, where you said five, nine, one thirty? that's a pretty normalish weight in my mind, but where, where yeah, I would say right now I'm happy at where I'm at. If I gain more, that's great. If I don't, that's okay too. I don't want to stress my body with a goal of gaining weight. So right now I'm just trying to find peace with food without stuffing myself because that happened to like to gain weight. I really had to eat more than I was comfortable eating with and I've gotten used to that. So I need to 
learn to regulate my, my satiation, if that makes sense. And then are you, as far as, oh, are you able to exercise? Does the protocol allow you to do that? I mean, if so, what kind yes, of- Yes, I yeah. strength train at a CrossFit gym four times a week. So I love to move my body. I do a lot of functional fitness. I use the skiing machines. I do a lot of, of free weights and I climb ropes. Okay. And then, yeah, obviously that's, I would assume that's a huge improvement over where you were when you were at your- 65 pounds and i can't imagine you were that strong at 65 pounds so that's no i couldn't even carry a pot of water around i know i was cooking food and i would ask my mom hey can you please pour off the water and i know now i was doing that because i really wasn't strong enough to do it but i did start strength training when i was very low weight like 80 pounds because you just have to to gain muscle the muscle doesn't come from itself so that was a big part in recovery as well yeah, good for you for doing that because it's it's hard work and it's it's I, I I do it all the time. It's still hard work. It's always been hard for me, and I just suck it up and get it done. Good for you. Any outside of your family who obviously sees you every day, any of your friends or acquaintances or people you run into have noticed a change? Has that been anything commented on that? Yes. Yeah, so I actually have always gone on walks in my neighborhood, and so you know the people that are walking too, and a lot of them have recently said that I look great. I look better. And I'm really happy to hear that because although on the inside, I still have a lot of work to do. I did achieve quite a bit with gaining all that weight back. And I think although both inside and outside appearance is very important, now that I've gained weight, I know that my body has more power to heal on the inside too. So yes, many people are noticing and a lot of people are always getting pictures of me, my mom's friends, and they all are saying I look great. So that's a relief. Yeah, that's got to feel good and, and good for you for sharing that as well. You said social media. What is, what are some of your, what is, you said an Instagram account. What, what is the name of that? So if people wanted to look and see, see where you've come from and what you're up to, where, where do they go? My handle is cure, C U R E dot E did E A T E. How do you spell that? I said E what? E A T E D. Eat it. I was, it was a pun with cured by food, by cured by okay. eating. I don't cured, know. Eat it. I thought it was funny. Now it's kind of weird. It's cured dot eat it or dash? Yes. No D. C U R E dot E A T E D. Oh, eat it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I was like, eat it. Okay. Cure, eat it. Yeah. I'm trying to find it real quick. Okay. A lot of pictures of food on there, it looks like. Is that what you have there? No counts. Yes. I actually recently started having some avocado as well because. I was craving it and I it's summer, so I thought I could have avocado and it's been working well. Okay, very good. And I, I, it looks like I'm looking at the you know, first pin picture. That's when you were probably thinner a little bit. Yeah, definitely you were thinner with a steak in your hand. Oh, my gosh, there's a picture of you on the beach and you definitely were quite thin. Yeah. Wow. That is, you weren't kidding. Goodness. Okay. So. You clearly have managed to turn that around quite a bit. Good for you. Congratulations. That's awesome. Even though you said you didn't have an eating disorder because you just couldn't, even though you're eating a lot, lot, there are a number of people, and there was actually a case series published in the Journal of Insulin Resistance recently on a number of people, I think both men and women that had severe anorexia and they were able to return to normal weight. So I think this is interesting, the carnivore diet for a lot of people that are obese it's, it tends to normalize our weight to a leaner weight and people that are very thin, it does the opposite. It gets us to our more normal body composition, body weight. Do you, you, I noticed you were very particular about how much you eat down to the gram or the ounce or something like that. Are you focusing on a certain protein percentage or fat percentage or number that you're trying to hit every day? Is that something that you, Tom? I would say I'm aware of it. I know how much food I need to feel full and to maintain my weight or even gain. So that's why I know those numbers. But I would say I do aim for at least one gram of protein for pound of weight. And then the rest of my calories normally come from fat. So I would say I eat over 2,500 calories every day. Majority of those coming from fat. I really like bone marrow. So I'll eat five or six ounces of bone marrow every night. Yeah, bone marrow is quite tasty. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a quote unquote organ meat, but one that actually tastes pretty good, I think. So, and interestingly, your bone marrow is 
Mm-hmm. Have you been back to the hematologist since you normalized your hemoglobin A1C or not your hemoglobin, your, your CBC? Have you, or your hematocrit, have you been back to the hematologist and have they commented on that or what's the story on that? I actually have an appointment soon, but I was thinking of contacting the original hematologist that did my biopsy and just to show him the power of the carnivore diet, because I bet they hadn't ever seen that before. Yeah, it would be cool. And, and as far as your your hereditary spherocytosis, I'm wondering, I'm, I, 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 that's not a super common condition. I don't think it is. Uh, I have not, re- I don't recall anybody with that condition going carnivore. So it's another one that, you know, and, and whether it impacts it in, in a positive way, it sounds like it has. It's, can I make a comment on it really quick? Of course. So my father and my brother both also have it. It's hereditary. So <laughs> came from my father. And they both have relatively normal hemoglobins. And we were told it's because their bone marrow is able to compensate. It just makes more because it knows things are dying. And since I then also had the bone marrow condition where I wasn't able to produce enough, that's why I became anemic. Because I had, a, I had an anemia of loss and then a production problem, which le- yields in a net negative. Yeah. Yeah, it's always like how much you make and how much you're destroying and so far. And that's a net amount. Fascinating stuff. I applaud you on your recovery. I applaud you on sharing your story. And it sounds like it's a you've been through hell <laughs> on the other side. It looks like things are looking up and I wish you continued success. Anything else we didn't touch on that you'd like to share? Not that I know of. I guess I just want to take one more moment to encourage anyone who isn't sure about their health and doesn't really see any improvement to just seek out other options. And I do want to make a point that chronic inflammatory response syndrome can only be reversed as of now with the Shoemaker protocol. It's very systematic. It's evidence-based, peer-reviewed. And some people will try to sell you some like binders like clay and bentonite. That's not going to treat biotoxin illness. It might help with mold poisoning, but not with SIRS. So I made the mistake. I saw a practitioner who didn't know what they were doing for two years and I just got sicker. So just a warning call to everyone. Okay. Thanks for sharing that. Anyway, I appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Helen, continued success on your journey and I'll, I'll follow your Instagram page and see, oh, see, thank you. see how you progress over the years. Anyway, for the rest of you guys, thank you so much for being here. We'll be back again tomorrow. Everybody take care. Thanks. Thanks, Helen. Thank you. Bye.